Good morning, class. This is this is a reading for my students in PSY 3310 at Troy University. This is a class called Sensation and Perception, and I'm reading a brief sketch of the biography of Dr. Milton H. Erickson, a former psychiatrist, psychiatrist who, who left his body years ago, but he left a mark in the world of uh, people helping. And I'm reading from the book, Hope and Resiliency by Dan Short, one of Milton Erickson's students, by Betty Alice Erickson, Erickson's wife, and Roxana Erickson Klein, Erickson's daughter. Erickson was a very exponential kind of person, uh, which resulted in him seeing exponential kinds of results from his life and work. So I'm going to start uh, at the overview, and it, it's a brief biographical, biographical sketch. So here I go. Milton H. Erickson, 1901 to, to 1980. For him, hope and resiliency were a way of living life and therefore a natural basis for his approach to psychotherapy. Erickson began practicing medicine in the late 1920s, a time characterized by the newly emerging practice of psychotherapy characterized for the treatment of neurosis and when long-term institutional care was the only available solution for psychotic and mental illness still using old terms. By, by 1940, Erickson had already distinguished himself as someone who had a unique approach to healing. He had published more than 40 papers and would soon come to be known as the world's leading authority on medical hypnosis. Over a period of five decades, he illustrated his method of therapy in 119 published case reports. An additional 200 case examples were described in books published by those who studied his approach, O'Hanlon and Hexham, 1990. Erickson's writings and seminars helped inspire a new generation of therapists. His pioneer strategic and brief approaches to psychotherapy at a time when all psychotherapy was psychoanalytical. His unorthodox practice of bringing members of the family into therapy sessions helped inspire the creation of family therapy. He and a few others ushered in the paradigm shift from the long investigative process that formerly characterized psychotherapy to the realization that effective therapy can and should be brief, internally directed with a focus to the sub subject's ability to participate and enjoy life in the present and future. As single subject research design becomes more common in clinical studies, it is likely that the field will continue to evolve in the direction of individualizing treatment to meet the needs of the patient, a practice that was one of the hallmarks of Erickson's approaches. In addition, his direct contributions, num numerous influential figures in the social sciences collaborated with Erickson, including Gregory Bateson, a scientist and philosopher who contributed to the fields of cybernetics, education, family therapy, and ecology. Margaret Mead, the world-renowned anthropologist who was the first to conduct psychologically oriented field work, and Lewis Wolberg, an innovative psychodynamic theorist and pioneer in medical hypnosis. Lawrence Kuby, an eminent psychoanalyst, John Larson, known for his work in the invention of the polygraph, Ernest Rossi, a leader in the field of mind-body research, and Jay Haley, one of the founders of Family Therapy, along with Virginia Satir, I might add. Family background. Erickson was the offspring of two highly determined individuals. Erickson's father, Albert, lost his, his father at the age of 12. Three years later, Albert left Chicago to become a farmer. He had nothing but the clothes on his back and a train ticket. After going as far west as his money would take him, Albert began looking for work in the 
farming community of Lowell, Wisconsin. He hitched a ride to a farmer's house to seek work as a hired hand. At the house, he saw a pretty girl watching him from behind a tree. Albert asked, whose girl are you? She confidently replied, I'm my daddy's girl. He responded, well, you're my girl now. <laughs> Five years later, Albert and Clara were married. Eventually, they would have nine children and share 73 wedding anniversaries. <clears throat> Erickson's mother showed a level of determination no less than his father's. When she was 16 years old, she heard her aunt lamenting on how famous their ancestors were and that no descendant would ever merit the name Highland, H-Y-L-A-N-D, a much admired relative of the previous generations. Young Clara boldly replied, when I grow up and get married and have a baby boy, I'm going to name him Highland. Milton Highland Erickson was her second child. He was born in 1901 in a three-sided three-sided log cabin with a dirt floor that backed up to a mountain. This was a desolate region of, of the Nevada Sierras in a long since vanished silver mining town known as Aurum. As the family grew, Albert and Clara wanted better educational opportunities for their children. So they moved east in a covered wagon. As a child, Erickson was recognized as being different. Although he lived in a rural community with a paucity of printed material, he had an insatiable appetite for reading and amused himself by reading the dictionary for hours at a time. Ironically, he had multiple sensory disorders and apparently had a reading disorder. Erickson later described himself as dyslexic and said that when he was six, his teacher, Ms. Walsh, spent many hours helping him correct his mistranslation of symbols. One day, Erickson had a sudden burst of insight. His teacher highlighted the most important features of the symbol three, the numeral three, by turning it on its side. Erickson explains that in a binding flash of light, he suddenly saw the difference between a three and an M. On many other occasions, she would use the same method of instruction. She would take something that was very familiar and then suddenly impose it into an area of confusion. Erickson was grateful for what his teacher had taught him and remembered her method, which later became the inspiration for his use of reorientation and a technique known as therapeutic shock. In addition to problems interpreting symbols, Erickson was colorblind and tone deaf. Rather than become discouraged by these multiple handicaps, Erickson dedicated himself to careful observation of the world around him. At the age of 15, he wrote an article for the magazine Wisconsin Agriculturalist about the problem of young people li living on the farm and why they eventually leave this setting. From his earliest childhood, Erickson was looking for a way to make a difference in the world. This is one reason he had so much admiration for the country doctor who brought hope and comfort into the homes of families who were otherwise frightened and isolated. In 1919, Erickson contracted one of the most dreaded diseases of the time, poliomyelitis. His prognosis was poor and he overheard the doctor sadly tell his parents that their boy would be dead by morning. Erickson did not feel that anyone had the right to tell a mother that their boy would be dead by morning. In defiance of this morose prediction, Erickson used what little voice he still had to instruct his mother to move his dresser to a certain angle near the foot of his bed. She thought he was delirious, but did as he asked. This arrangement allowed Erickson to see down the hallway and out the window of the other room which faced west. Later, Erickson explained, I was damned if I would die without seeing one more sunset. After seeing the sunset, Erickson lost consciousness for three days. <clears throat> when he awoke, he could move only his eyes and speak with great difficulty. He was paralyzed in almost every part of his body. 
All of the independence he had been working to achieve throughout childhood and adolescence suddenly vanished. Though he was physically trapped by his illness, Erickson still had an unyielding interest in learning. He spent his time as an invalid listening to sounds and interpreting their meaning. For example, he would listen to the sound of footsteps in order to determine who was coming and what sort of mood the person was in. One of his most crucial learning experiences came on a day when Erickson's family left him in the house alone. His body was bound to a rocking chair so that he could have the advantage of sitting up. Erickson did not have much of a view from his position in the room and wished he could be closer to the window so that he could at least have the pleasure of viewing the outside world. As he sat thinking about what it would be like to be closer to the window, he noticed that his rocking chair slowly began to rock. Erickson believed that this was an extraordinary discovery. By merely having the idea of progress, he was able to activate some previously unrecognized muscular potential. <clears throat> During the following weeks and months, Erickson probed his memories for bodily sensations associated with developing movement. He would try to remember what it felt like in his fingers when he held certain objects. Progress came slowly in very small portions. First, he got a twitch in one of his fingers. Then he learned to consciously initiate the movement. Then he learned to move more than one finger. Then he learned to move his fingers in uncoordinated ways. Next, he developed special resistance exercises that helped him coordinate his movements. Erickson also studied the movements of his youngest sister, who was just learning to walk. He dissected her behavior into a series of component skills that he could practice for himself. He later explained, I learned to stand up by watching baby sister learn to stand up. Use two hands for a base, uncross your legs, use the knees for a wide base, then put more pressure on one arm and hand to get up. His willingness to explore the power of ideas and the connection between thinking and the body proved to be key elements in his recovery. <clears throat> After having a physician at the university recommend vigorous use of his muscles during rehabilitation, Erickson decided he would strengthen his body by paddling a canoe from the Rock River in Milwaukee to the Mississippi and on to St. Louis. <clears throat> He had planned the trip with a companion, but his friend unexpectedly changed his mind at the last minute. Erickson was extraordinarily determined. But because his parents were already uncomfortable with the excursion, he decided not to tell them that he would be handling the canoe and his crutches alone. In the summer of 1922, Erickson was carried to the river by friends. So he was 22 years old. He had two weeks supply of food, cooking gear, a tent, several textbooks, a few dollars in cash, and a tremendous confidence in his ability to make use of whatever situations he encountered. For instance, when he stopped by the first of many dams, Erickson pulled himself up on a pier and waited for someone to pass by and ask what he was there, why he was there. Erickson found that when he allowed others to approach him, they were more likely to volunteer help. Along the way, he was given temporary jobs by local farmers and fishermen. He earned his board for a 250-mile segment of the trip by cooking for two men who were also traveling the river. On many other occasions, he earned his supper by telling stories to fishermen. <clears throat> the depth of his interest as a student of human behavior deepened during this journey. He was able to see many different ways of living Six weeks later, Erickson had developed tremendous strength in his arms and shoulders and was able to paddle up against the river current as he headed north from St. Louis back to Milwaukee. He had learned to walk again and was able to carry his canoe on his shoulder. In all, Erickson covered 1,200 river miles and returned home after 10 weeks with $5 in his pocket. From a state of total paralysis and partial loss of speech, 
Erickson regained the ability to walk with crutches and speak clearly within 11 months. After approximately two years of rehabilitation in the fall of 1920, Erickson was able to attend his freshman year at the University of Wisconsin. Erickson's determination to regain the, few, the full use of his limbs led him into a journey of discovery beyond what could have initially been hoped. Professional beginnings. Having participated in research on hypnosis with Clark Hull Erickson, uh, uh, Clark Hull Erickson continued to postgrad, postgraduate medical school in Wisconsin, and at the age of 26, qualified for his medical degree and Master of Art in Psychology. He began his career conducting psychological testing and research for the State Board of Control of Wisconsin. Even after earning his medical degree, Erickson would continue to identify himself as both a psychologist and a psychiatrist. Erickson's first internship in general medicine was at the Colorado General Hospital. He trained in psychiatry at the nearby Colorado, Colorado Psychopathic Hospital under the direction of Dr. Franklin Ebal. During his psychiatric residency, Erickson learned to use his disabilities to his advantage. The fact that he was crippled and had to use a cane made him more approachable by his patients. The fact that he did not see the world in the same way as everyone else enabled him to better understand those who had been institutionalized. With high recommendations from his internship, Erickson was able to secure a position as assistant physician at the highly re reputable Rhode Island State Hospital for Mental Diseases. There, Erickson conducted intensive studies in the relationship of mental deficiencies to family and environmental factors and published the results. He then advanced to a new appointment at the state hospital in Worcester, Massachusetts, from, so from 1930 to 1934, he progressed from junior physician to chief research psychiatrist. Unfortunately, this rapid professional success coincided with the decline of his marriage. <clears throat> 1934, Erickson divorced his first wife and was awarded full custody of his three small children. He moved to Michigan, where he became director of psychiatric research and training at Wayne County Hospital in Eloise, a Detroit suburb. The domestic setback made Erickson even more determined to understand the dynamics of healthy family relationships. A lifelong motto of Erickson's was that mistakes are best embraced as a valuable learning experience. In 1936, he married Elizabeth Moore, whom he called Betty who was a loving mother for her instant family of three children. Over the years, the Erickson family would grow with the birth of five additional children. She and Erickson had a sense of mutual devotion that filled the rest of his lifetime. Erickson valued his family life. His future professional dealings encircled the life of the family. Both at Eloise and throughout 30 years of private practice in Phoenix, the Erickson family lived on site. During the 14 years at the hospital, the family lived in an apartment in the hospital grounds. During his 30 years of private practice, Erickson's office was in the home where his children saw him between sessions and interacted with his patients if his patients wanted that contact. If patients were of an age that Erickson's children might establish friendships with them, Erickson either encouraged the relationship or made it implicitly clear that a friendship was not appropriate. In his future travels as a lecturer, Erickson was often accompanied by Elizabeth when he traveled. She and other family members, when available, were often used as de demonstration subjects. Erickson's growth was linked to the growth of the family. He was constantly searching for ways to expand his thinking and those around him. At home, he enjoyed presenting a puzzle or a riddle that no one could figure out. There were games, contests, and problems presented with a great praise for original solutions. This was done in a spirit of fun. It is clear from both his professional legacy and his daily interactions with his family 
that Erickson truly enjoyed seeking novel and creative solutions to problems. His personal appreciation for the significance of the family translated into pioneering work in the 1940s and 1950s, when Erickson was among the first in the field to use the family to resolve problems and promote individual well-being. In 1947, a minor accident occurred that would eventually alter the direction of Erickson's career. <clears throat> While riding his bicycle, Erickson was knocked to the ground by a dog. The fall resulted in skin lacerations on his arms and forehead. After receiving a tetanus anti antitoxin, he de de developed a life-threatening reaction. Due to his severely weakened condition, Along with frequent allergy problems and chronic muscle pain, Erickson was no longer able to tolerate the cold and dampness of the Michigan winter. While still in a state of fragile health, Erickson was placed on a train with two medical interns who accompanied him to Phoenix. Erickson had been invited to come to the warmer climate by a friend and colleague, Dr. John Larson. At the time, Larson served as superintendent of the Arizona State Hospital. He would soon have Erickson join his staff. Approximately one year after Erickson's move to Phoenix in the spring of 1949, Larson left his position and moved to California. At the time, Erickson also decided to leave the hospital and transition to private practice work. <clears throat> In 1953, Erickson became severely ill with what is now recognized as post-polio syndrome. During this time, his pain was extraordinary. He experienced muscle cramps so severe that some muscles literally tore themselves apart. Even during these moments of great hardship and confinement to bed, he found the energy and concentration necessary to accept phone calls from individuals seeking his aid. His genuine concern for others provided a welcome distraction from his own physical pain. After recovering from what was believed at the time to be a second attack of polio, Erickson had lost many of the muscles in his arm, back, abdomen, and legs. However, he still managed to maintain a busy lecture schedule, including travel across the country and abroad. Though not as severe as the 1953 attack, Erickson endured further episodes of intense pain and confinement in bed. <clears throat> the 1950s would be one of the most eventful periods of Erickson's career. It was this time that he became a nationally known figure. He was featured in popular news media such as Life magazine. He was also consulted as an expert in psychology and human behavior by famous athletes, the U.S. military, the FBI in the Aerospace Laboratory of Medicine. In 1957, Erickson co-founded the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. Earlier, he and four colleagues formed seminars on hypnosis, which taught medical, dental, and psychological uses of hypnosis throughout the country. He and his colleagues agreed to use $50,000 from that enterprise to fund the educational arm of ASCH. Erickson served as a founding, as founding president of ASCH for two years and as founding editor of the ASCH journal for 10 years. By 1967, the continued deterioration of muscles forced Erickson to, to use a wheelchair during his travels. While in Delaware, September 1967, speaking at what was to be one of his final lectures on the road, Erickson remarked that he was learning to find joy in all of the new things he could experience from the vantage point of a wheelchair. By 1969, traveling became too exhausting, so Erickson focused his energy on his activities at his home office, which included writing papers, editing, seeing patients, and training therapists. Using the skills that as a youth enabled him to survive polio, Erickson refused to live life as an invalid, and much like the archetypal wounded healer, he found the inner resources necessary to continue helping others for as long as possible. His compelling contributions did not go unnoticed. In 1976, at the 
seventh Congress of the International Franklin Gold Medal Award for the highest achievement in the theory and practice of hypnotism. Despite a lifetime of chronic pain and illness, Erickson embraced a love of the life he had been given. Through his suffering, Erickson learned to value humor and the simple pleasures of life. For instance, having become infirm, he attached a horn to his wheelchair and joked with some of his patients about being an old codger. During the teaching seminars conducted from his office, nearly all of the exercises were approached in a humorous manner that brought a sense of playful enjoyment to the learning process. While training therapist, Erickson taught one of his favorite lessons using what looked like a large granite rock. He kept this prop by him in his office and at the right moment would reach down and begin the arduous task of lifting it to his lap. Watching this was difficult for the students. They had to struggle with whether or not they should risk insulting Erickson by offering assistance or just watch him sit and watch a frail old man struggle to lift a granite rock into his lap. When it was finally resting in his lap, Erickson would look around at each of the students and then slowly lift it again, and without warning, lunge it effortlessly, effortlessly through the air into the lap of a stunned student. What appeared to be a heavy rock was actually an almost weightless piece of foam. Erickson would fix his eyes on the student and say, not everything is as it seems. The shock would soon wear off, but the lesson would never be forgotten. Erickson's greatest pleasure seemed to be derived from, com from community building. Over the years, there were literally hundreds of patients and students who were also receiving therapy who developed valued and long-lasting relationships with Erickson's family members. 25 years after Erickson's death, many of those friendships still flourish. This flexibility and creative use of resources added elements of sharing, learning together, social support, and extended family to Erickson's family, to Erickson's therapy. As he aged, Erickson's physical complications multiplied exponentially. In 1974, he commented to Rossi that the pain had become so intense and pervasive that he felt like a stranger in his own body. Toward the end of his life, he had great difficulty lifting his right arm, and he had very little strength in his hands. Many of the muscles in his face and mouth were paralyzed. Despite these physical obstacles, Erickson continued to use what strength he had left to provide therapy and training to individuals from around the world. At the time of his death, Tuesday evening, March the 25th, 1980, Erickson's teaching schedule was already filled through the end of the year, and there were unconfirmed applications that would have extended his appointments far into the following year. Erickson remained a pro productive up until the very last moments of his life, playing his part to make a difference in the world. As can be seen in this brief biological biographical sketch, Erickson's life was characterized by determination resiliency, and hope. The ideas that he advocated within his therapy are the same ideas exemplified by how he lived his life. He had a profound appreciation for the strength that comes from a willingness to establish meaningful objectives and then doing something in relation to that goal. For Erickson, progress was not dependent on things going his way. He derived intrinsic satisfaction by acquiring some new understanding by seeking to learn something from his physical disabilities, Erickson understood how to provide hope to those who no longer felt they could help themselves. He fostered resiliency in his patients through the strategic activation of latent abilities. This was an important part of his approach to healing. He believed that all people have within them the answer to whatever challenges they face. That's it, boys and girls. Thanks for listening.